My name is Reggie Tuppins. I'm an enrolled citizen of the Upper Mattapani Tribe, located in King William, Virginia, and I'm going to be your MC for the performance this afternoon. With us, we have Stony Creek, their Hollowatsa pony from Hollister, North Carolina. I know that. Whew. A little slow start here. And they'll be providing the drumming for this evening. We're going to start off with a grand entry, which is typical at all powwows, and it's when generally the flags are brought in and the dancers will come in, and that will be the beginning of all the dancing for that particular day. In some powwows, they'll have several grand entries or a couple grand entries. So we're going to start off with the grand entry, and we'll have our bustle dancers, I believe, that will be leading that in. Stony Creek. What did you think about that? Wasn't that great? So the, the outfits that everybody is wearing is regalia. They're not costumes. Um, it takes a lot of work. It's built to your personal 
um, likes. It builds your spirituality and your culture into it. And that's why we call it a regalia and not a costume. And these dancers obviously have spent a lot of time working with their regalia and also learning how to do their dances appropriately. I'll announce them more specifically, but today we have um, dancers from the Nanzaman tribe, Cree, Nanakote, and Upper Mattapanai, and obviously the drum group from the Hawasaponi. So we have several different tribes that are represented here today. And at any given powwow, you could have people from all over the country. Even powwows that are on the East Coast will draw people from all over the country to it. Our first uh, dance that we're going to be doing after the grand entry is the straight dance, or southern straight dance. Uh, Mike Harmon from the uh, Nanakote tribe will be doing that dance. The southern straight dance originated in the southern plains of Oklahoma, and the, the style of dance, from what I understand, is um, came about when bustles and other things of that nature were outlawed by the United States. Um, it also has its origins with the warrior societies, and you'll see what their mo movements are a little bit more uh, demure, demure than the bustle dancers. And it's also a portrayal of either like hunting or tracking or something of that nature. So, Southern Straight. Thank you, Mike. 
If you notice, there is a little bit of difference between the style of song for the Grand Entry and for the Southern Strait. The Grand Entry song and many of the songs that will be done um, in this performance are northern traditional songs. That particular one, it's a southern style of dance, so it's a southern song. So the structure is a little bit different on those songs. Next up, we're going to have Angela or Angie doing the fancy dance. The fancy dance style was a men's dance uh, originally and started out in the 1920s. And over time, the women started to dance that dance as well and originally danced the same regalia as the men did. Over time, it progressed and they came about with their own um, style of dress for that. Today, you hear it referred to as a butterfly dance, a fancy shawl, and it is one of the most energetic dances that we have. It takes a really strong athlete to be able to do that, especially in a competitive level. Angie? So some of the larger powwows across the nation, uh, especially the competition powwows, they have an Iron Man or Iron Woman's um, competition. Can you imagine doing that dance for 10, 12, 13 songs in a row? Takes a lot of energy, a lot of stamina. I know I couldn't do it. Next up, the style of dance that we're gonna have is um, a jingle. It's a healing dance. It's something that originated out of the Ojibwe tribe um, or Ojibwe people in the northern uh, area of the United States. There are uh, several diff different stories um, about that origin on it. Um, the one that I was taught that I learned is that there was a young girl who was sick and her grandfather had this dream about the, these four women dancing in this particular dress and it had these cones that made this distinct um, sound. And he dreamt that over and over again. And when he woke, he helped worked with his wife and they made those dresses and they had four women dance that dance. And when they finished, then the girl was starting to heal and later she did fully heal from that. You'll find at um, many powwow ceremonies, um, especially with the missing and uh, murdered indigenous women, 
Uh, quite often they'll have healing dances, and when they do those dances, the women will not wear feathers. <laughs> Over time, it went from that more old style dance to a contemporary style, which you'll see here today, I think both. And um, it's a little bit more of an energetic step. And it has spread out throughout the nation now, and most tribes have people that do the jingle dress dance. You'll see that with a lot of the dances, many of the dances that are the powwows, even around here, are Western style dance that other tribes have picked up, although most tribes do do their dances that are specific to their tribe as well. So next up, the jingle dress. Two dancers doing that dance were Nikki Bass of the Nansman tribe and my daughter Rachel Tuffins, who is Upper Mattapani in Chickahominy. And again, that was a healing dance, and I think it's really important to um, acknowledge throughout the nation there's a really serious issue with uh, missing and murdered indigenous women. And um, it happens out on a lot of the reservations, and there are women that are, that are lost you know, forever. Um, it's probably the highest rate of any of the races in the, the United States. And the jingle dress dance um, has gotten more popular over time, but especially that portion, that traditional portion, that healing portion, and in honor. And they even have um, red dance um, dances for that, and that's in honor of those women that are missing and murdered. Next up, we're going to have the men's traditional, and it's northern traditional. You know the difference because they'll have buff, um, bustles on their back, and that's a plain style um, dance, and that has been incorporated into even our tribes here in the West. 
and Keith Anderson, um, who happens to be chief of the Nansman tribe, and his son, Kalen Anderson. and Kaylin Anderson doing the men's traditional or northern traditional dance. You see some of the items on their regalia, the bustle is one that's uh, indicative of that northern traditional dancer. And they'll usually have some type of staff. Um, they'll have a shield quite often, a breastplate, which is made out of hair pipe or hollowed out bone, some type of uh, headpiece, either a roach or like a, a mop top, it's a dog soldier type um, headpiece and then other things that are personal uh, to them. Um, bells are another thing that are often uh, used frequently. Uh, brass bells or for Eastern tribes, quite often it's the deer toes or the toenail off of a deer, ho deer hoof. Next up, we're gonna have Angie back um, doing a hoop dance. The hoop dance is a medicine dance um, out of the Taos uh, Pueblo. Uh, there's competitions that are at the Herd Museum every year out in Arizona uh, with this dance. It's another one that's pretty uh, energetic. You'll see her dance and use these hoops and go through them and making different um, shapes or objects, animals, and telling a story with that. So as she goes through this, 
try to pay attention and imagine to what she's making before she um, possibly tells you at, at the end or just use your imagination to figure out what she's doing uh, with that and what she's showing. As I said, that's another energetic dance. Um, and sometimes uh, with these performances, they go even longer. Um, for each dancer, they use however many hoops they want to. Some use many more. Um, and you have young people, young uh, boys, young girls that even start with that. And if you're ever um, out in the Arizona area and have an opportunity to go to the Herd Museum, um, look that up for that competition. It has all the best hoop dancers across the United States that compete there. Next up, we're going to go back to our jingle dress dancers, and we're going to have a double beat.
Okay. The drum group is throwing an audible here. Uh, we're going to do a sidestep. Competition powwows, quite often, that particular dance is a decider between who finishes first and who finishes second. It's obviously another one of those strenu strenuous dances and uh, takes a lot of energy to do. So we're gonna see if um, we can get Stony Creek to, can you pull together a trot song? We're gonna bring uh, Mike Harmon back out to do a trot song. This is another Southern straight song uh, it's a trot song or some called a horse stealing song.
Okay, next up, we're going to have our men's northern traditional come out again for a sneak up. So sneak up is a warrior's dance, and you'll see the, them dancing, and they're portraying something that they did in battle or in the hunt. And it's a chance for them to boast over you know, what they were doing and what they accomplished. So watch and see, and you can see their movements, and you see the differences in the changing of the drumming and when they're portraying those uh, actions. That's the sneak up dance, and we had a had a short stop at the end, and it's something that you see a lot of times at a competition powwow. And uh, you have to be really alert. You have to pay attention to where you are in the song to be able to hit that stop. And you can see the the difference when they go down, and they're either tracking their enemy or tracking that animal. And then you see the faster beat and all, and it's at celebration afterwards. So it gives that dancer an opportunity to portray you know, what they're thinking about, their hunt, their experience, what they did in, in battle. So we're going to try to bring um, dancers back out again. Uh, I think we'll do all dancers if our men's traditional have uh, recovered quick enough and do a crow hop. A uh, crow hop style uh, dance, if you watch their movement and if you've ever seen a crow there as they're moving along, they don't walk, they kind of hop uh, along as they move and you'll see the dancers in their motions and it will look like that crow hopping along.
don't think I was really fair to the men's traditional dancers. I think we had a couple tired crows out there. So a couple questions for you, um, everybody here. Who's ever been to a powwow before? So we have a fair amount of people. Who's seen Native American dance before? Oh, that's a whole lot more people. So have you enjoyed yourself this evening? It's a, a lot of hard work for the dancers, and I think I can speak for everybody and the singers as well that they enjoy this. It's something um, that they do by choice and not just to do performances, but it is a lot of work, and there's a lot of time that goes into it, and you sacrifice to be able to do that. So hearing the applause and seeing people's excitement and their enjoyment of it, it really helps you know, with the dancers and to keep them going. So we've uh, run through most of the dances that we're, we've um, plan for today. We are going to finish up with the closing dance with all the dancers and then for uh, for singers, singers like to sing and shows are short and you don't do that many songs so you can give them the opportunity if they want to do a closing song and jam one out after uh, the closing dance then that's up to you guys. So we're going to We're going to do our closing dance in a second. I'm going to give them a little bit of time to catch their breath because that's a pretty energetic uh, dance. So um, who is familiar with any local tribes around, say, in the Virginia area? So there are seven federally recognized tribes uh, in Virginia, mine being one, Upper Mattapanai. I have to count on my fingers here. There's the Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Nanzamin, Monacan, Pamunkey and Arapahannock. All of the tribes except for the Monacan are an Algonquin cultured um, tribes. Monacan being an Eastern uh, Siouan and they're a different culture and different language uh, than ours. A lot of people don't know that there are many tribes up and down the East Coast. All of our tribes had first contact. We call ourselves first contact tribes. The tribes in our area had contact with the English uh, initially in, in 1607 but our first contact was with the Spanish in the uh, 1550s. So it's a long time. A lot of the Western tribes didn't have sustained contact until the middle and late 1800s. So the fact that we've uh, survived, and not only survived, but thrive, uh, is a testament to our ancestors and to our forefathers that we're able to still share our songs and our dances and our culture with people is really, uh, just a testament to them, and, and, and it's a, something that we enjoy to do, and I, and I think it's part of the fabric of the United States. And if it should ever go away, I think it would be um, really bad for the United States overall. Um, this was and is our land. We are proud of it. Native Americans serve at a higher level than any other race in the armed forces. Still do that today. Uh, You know, we have been and always uh, will be a warrior society. Uh, it was about protecting the people. And that service is a continuation of that because this is our country, this is our land. And it was, we were here, you know, first. <laughs> <laughs> I won't get on my political soapbox because this is a fun event. But it's, it's important to acknowledge that and that the culture has been here and has been sustained. And it's very different all throughout the country, the differences between Eastern tribes and Western tribes and tribes in Oklahoma and Arizona. We have similarities, but there's very distinct differences. So as you, as you travel throughout the country, if you have the opportunity to visit one of those other tribes, see one of those cultures, experience that, do, look at it, and compare it to what you saw here today or at a local powwow or a powwow in another state in Montana or South Dakota or somewhere like that. And, try to see for yourself the differences between those cultures. So we're gonna have all of our dancers back in at, for a closing dance. Typically with the powwow, um, we would bring the colors out and that would be the end of it. And you'll see um, the dancing doesn't start until the drum starts. And the dancing stops when the drum, start, uh, the drum stops. The drum is called the heartbeat of the people. It's a circle and it's really a powerful, it's a living being. Um, these men singing these songs spend a lot of time learning the language and putting those songs together. And it's, it's a really powerful thing. It carries their voices up, carries their, their songs, 
you know, to the Great Spirit. And they, uh, these gentlemen here, Stony Creek, have been singing for a long time since they were young boys. They've, they've performed all across the country at powwows and, and different shows and festivals and are very highly regarded on the powwow trail. So enough of my talking. We're going to bring out the rest of the dancers again for a closing song. I hope you really hope you enjoyed yourself. Um, I hope you enjoyed the dancing and the singing. There's some really good dancers. Uh, if you have the opportunity to go out to a powwow around in Virginia, the D.C., Maryland area, you'll see some of these uh, dancers out there. Uh, I think the Nanakote, um, their powwow is coming up next weekend in, in Delaware. And uh, we really appreciate you coming and spending some time with us this afternoon. I hope you really enjoyed uh, the presentation and the dancing. And I'm going to leave you with uh, a song from Stony Creek. Hey! Hey!
Thank you.